Well, good morning once again. Miles Fagan, Mount Evelyn Presbyterian Church. Wonderful to see you all here, and it's great to be gathering together. Um, this morning we're going to be looking at John the Baptist and uh, a whole range of things with regards to that. Fascinating we're going to be looking at today. Anyway, before we do that, shall we pray? Father God, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we can gather in your name uh, to worship you and to honour you and to, and to live and follow you all the days of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the example of John the Baptist, who we're going to explore today and, and, and the joy that he expresses. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of this. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Wow. John the Baptist, um, or John the one who baptizes, has an extraordinary role in the telling of the gospel of God. So much so that Luke gives almost the entire first chapter of his gospel to talking about John, the one who baptizes. With so much attention, uh, John then disappears from the telling of the gospel as his role has been completed. And the next time that Luke really records about John is, is when uh, is, is, is in chapter 7, uh, in verses 24 to 28. And I'll just read these verses out. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A, a reed uh, swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there was no one greater than that of John. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Luke 7, verses 24 to 28. Well, that's just an extraordinary statement to make about John. And also about the least of those in the kingdom of God. So we're going to think about some of, the, some of these things. And we're going to look at John the beginning, uh, John the public ministry, and John the joy is mine. That's the three things we're looking at uh, today. So John the beginning. Uh, Jesus spoke of John as being the greatest of the prophets. In Luke 1, we find out the following. Uh, First of all, about John's parents. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were both from, both from priestly families. They were both, they, they were without children for, as it was recorded, Elizabeth was barren and they were past the childbearing age. However, they did pray for a child of their own. And Zechariah uh, was chosen to offer incense in, in the temple and it was then that the angel Gabriel appeared before him. And Gabriel told him that Elizabeth would conceive a son and they were to call him, not Zechariah after his name, they call him John. And Zechariah was not able to speak because, well, quite frankly, uh, he wasn't too sure if these words were true. <laughs> and from from Gabriel who had who had come from God but he was so overwhelmed everyone when he left came out and uh, and saw everyone else after giving incense they thought something had gone wrong he's been there for such a long time that they thought something uh, but they they all declared that he had seen an angel while Elizabeth advanced in years hid herself from society for the first five months of the pregnancy, for the Lord had taken away her reproach or the disappointment that many in society had shown towards her. You see, Elizabeth was without child, 
but now she was with child but now she was was with child and it was all very new and it took a while to get used to and at the sixth month of elizabeth's pregnancy with john the angel gabriel appeared before a virgin you know we're thinking oh i've heard this story to be married to joseph a carpenter in galilee saying that she will conceive the son of god unlike zechariah's response mary simply states the following and this is found in luke 1 34 to 38 how will this be mary asked the angel since i am a virgin the a the angel answered the holy spirit will come on will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you so the holy one to be born will be called the son of god even elizabeth your relative is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from god will ever fail mary answered i am the lord's servant may your word to me be fulfilled and the angel left her elizabeth was mary's uh, cousin and elizabeth was six months pregnant with with john and uh, and then we find what what happened when mary turned up in verses 39 to 45 of luke chapter 1. at that time mary got ready and hurried to to a town in the hill country of, of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my room, room uh, leapt for joy. Blessed is she, blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfil his promises to her. 39 to 45. And following the birth of John and then Zechariah finally been able to speak again for when asked what is his name Zechariah wrote down his name he's saying his name is John so everyone's going to call him Zechariah because that's what he did he then sang a song Zechariah did and the second part of the song is this this is a song about John and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. What a beautiful song. And it finishes off with verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he lived in, lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly in Israel. That's how Luke chapter 1 finishes. It's all about John the Baptist. It's all about what he was doing. Preparing the way. So what about the public ministry of John well the Apostle John the Apostle John different to John the Baptist the Apostle John and of course the writer of John's Gospel who we're looking at at the moment spoke of John the baptizer or John the Baptist as we often explore with these words this is this is mentioned in the prologue so John chapter 1 verses 6 to 8 there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning, 
concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. See, the Apostle John and Zechariah sang from the same song sheet, for the song sheet was authored by God. They were speaking about the one who would come before the Christ and bear witness to the light. And the Apostle John was once a disciple of John the Baptist. So he knew the intimate details of what John was preparing the world for at that time he was in Israel. The entrance to the Lamb of God. The entrance of the Lamb of God. The entrance of the bridegroom, as he would go on to describe. John the Baptist was speaking about the one to come with the expect with with the expectancy of a very dear friend waiting for the groom to appear at the wedding. See, at a wedding, and particularly a Jewish wedding, the most important person leading up to the wedding wasn't the bride or the bridegroom. No, it was, it was the friend, it was the best friend of the groom, for they would go and prepare everything and get everything organized, including the honeymoon. They would make sure that all the details were, were set and correct. And the, and the feast would, would last for several days. So it was his job to ensure that all the preparations were in place. It was his job to go and announce that the wedding is about to, uh, about to begin. It was his job to go and prepare the place, prepare the, the, the room, prepare for what was about to happen. For that was the friend of the friend of the bridegroom. That was John the Baptist. And on the day of the wedding, he awaits in the expectation of the arrival of the groom. And upon the arrival of the groom, he then introduces the bride to the bridegroom. His joy is complete, for all the attention turns then to the bride and the bridegroom. And the friend, even though he's been the most important person leading up to their wedding, he moves to the background and slips away from the focus of attention. See, the shout of acclamation of John when he saw Jesus and then baptized him with the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus was a fulfillment of his joy. His mission was complete. The groom had arrived and his joy was complete. The groom had arrived and there was nothing more to do. There was nothing else to do apart from say to the world, here is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. The implication that John draws here is that Jesus is God. You see, in the Old Testament, God is always the groom of Israel. And we find that through find that through all of the prophets as we did in Jeremiah. And Jesus Christ is the groom for his own people, of those whom he is shown mercy to, of those who he gives by uh, who, who he loves by giving of himself, of those who he offers himself as the sacrifice to win them. The groom has paid the price for his bride and his bride, friends, is the church. Oh, church, here is your groom. Let's think of the, the joy, John, uh, and the joy is mine. We're going to do it three ways. You know, joy is a word that exclaims great pleasure and happiness. And consider this word in, in, in three settings. First of all, um, John's mum, uh, Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, exclaimed great joy when Mary, the mother of Jesus, arrived to visit her at the sixth month of the pregnancy of John. And we read those words before of, of the joy that, that, that Elizabeth spoke of. It was joy in, in, it was John in her room that leaped for joy. And Elizabeth expressed like this to, to, uh, with the words that of, of the mother of my Lord has come to visit me. Such is the, uh, such is the joy that was being expressed by Elizabeth. What about John? Well, John's joy maybe is summarized in John chapter 3, verse 29. Some of us looked at this last week. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. And the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. You know, the friend of the bridegroom has, has a task to do, to introduce the groom to the bride. Once done, his work is finished and the bride and the groom belong to each other. John Colvin, in one of his commentaries, writes about this, and he says, This comparison frequently occurs in Scripture when the Lord intends to express the sacred bond of adoption by which he binds us to himself. For as he offers himself to be truly enjoyed by us, that he may be ours, so he justly claims from us, that mutual fidelity and love which the wife owes to her husband. This marriage is entirely fulfilled in Christ, whose flesh and bones we are, as Paul informs us in Ephesians 5 verse 30. The chastity demanded by him consists chiefly in the obedience of the gospel, that we might not suffer ourselves to be led aside from its pure simplicity, as the same apostle teaches us in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. We must, therefore, be subject to Christ alone. He must be our only head, and we must, we must not turn aside a hair's breadth away from the simple doctrine of the gospel. He alone must have the highest glory that he may attain the right and authority of being a bridegroom to us. You know, the friend of the bridegroom does not interfere with the relationship of the groom and the, and the bride, because that is a unique relationship between the groom and the bride. His task is done. And the joy of seeing the couple exchanging gifts is, is complete. You know, it's also the same when we witness a new believer coming to Christ. Our work is complete in the coming together of the, of the groom and the bride, for we have great joy. The angels in heaven certainly do. What starts then is a relationship of understanding in a full and complete way of who Jesus Christ is. We call this discipleship. And there were some, there were some great books. Uh, there's Transforming Discipleship. There's um, Personal Disciple Making. Um, there's Following the Master. Following the Master. Um, and there's uh, With Christ in the School of Disciple Making. All of these books are fantastic to understand how to go about making disciples, of understanding the relationship between the groom, Christ, and the bride, his church, which is us. However, this does not deter us and it should never deter us from continually proclaiming Christ. For that is what John the Baptist did all the way up to his death. This was his joy 
to continue to introduce the groom to the bride. So it also should be ours. You know, John the Baptist suffered greatly and so shall we as we introduce Christ to the world. In every situation though, Christ becomes great and we become less. So let's think about, we've looked at Elizabeth's joy, the joy that John the Baptist had. Let's think about the joy of Jesus. Maybe we haven't explored this before. Maybe we haven't really thought about the joy. Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, may be a different place to go when you're thinking about considering joy. Please consider this passage, though. Um, let me begin at verse 1 of chapter 12. Therefore, since we, have, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw ev off everything that hinders and the sin that, solely, that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father of God. Consider him who indeed who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, Jesus endured the cross because of the joy set before him. What was his joy? His joy was found in the resurrection and the glory that was to come and did. His resurrection and glory completed the completed the redemption of a people for the Father. They were once not a people, nor were, nor, nor were they a people who knew of mercy. Yet it was because of the love of the Father for the world that a people became his people. For the Father showed mercy. Indeed, this people became his bride. And the Father dec uh, decreed because of love. And the Son redeemed through love. And the Holy Spirit transforms as love for Christ fills the lives of believers. And John the Baptist, the friend of the groom, says to you, the bride, the followers of Christ, here is your groom the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. You know, follow him all the days of your life. You know, friends, fellow believers of Christ, Jesus becomes the example to us to follow as our great pioneer. And as from that passage that we just read of Hebrews, there was mentioned some words which we might not go, how does that relate to joy, particularly when we think of suffering? John Stott comments in his book, um, The Cross of Christ, um, The Cross of Christ, he mentions these words. Jesus clearly looked beyond his death to his resurrection, beyond his sufferings to his glory, and indeed was sustained in his trials by the joy set before him. It is equally clear that he expected his followers to share this perspective. The inevitability of suffering is, is a regular theme in his teaching and that of the apostles. At times, this suffering can be overwhelming. To be so dark and lonely that no one seems to care or show mercy in, in any way. There seems to be no joy at all. It is in those moments that we are to be like Jesus. And Stock comments a little bit later on. He says these words. Things look different when the horizon closes in upon us. A horror of great darkness engulfs us. 
and no glimmer of light shines to assure us that suffering can yet be productive. At such times, we can only cling to the cross, where Christ himself demonstrated that blessing comes through suffering. Uh, Page 326. It is for joy that Jesus endured the scorn of, of the cross. And friends, today I can say it is for joy of being with Christ forever that you as a Christian endure the scorn of suffering for you follow Christ because you are the bride of Christ. And in that we have great joy. And as John the Baptist would say, here is your groom. Let me introduce you to him. Amen.